today at the National Press Club, the Chief Executive of the CSIRO, Dr Megan Clark. Dr Clark has been in the job since 2009. She began her career as a mine geologist before taking on several senior roles with BHP Billiton. Today she'll discuss ways Australia can remain competitive in the face of global change. From the National Press Club in Canberra, Dr Megan Clark. On behalf of the National Press Club, welcome to the National Gallery of Australia for today's National Australia Bank Address. Uh, since her appointment as um, Chief Executive of the CSIRO back in 2009, one of the consistent themes uh, that Dr Megan Clark has pursued is the, the critical role of innovation in dealing with the sort of challenges we face, not just here in Australia, but really right around the globe. Food security, our water and energy needs, and, and the connection, the link uh, between those and, and the sort of global pressures we face uh, in terms of such things as uh, urbanisation, population growth. Today that's a, a theme she picks up again in her address, the innovation imperative. Please welcome Dr Megan Clark. Thank you very much, Laurie, and uh, good morning to everyone. It's a real privilege to be here and to speak with you um, and also to answer your, uh, your questions afterwards. In the next hour, I really wanted to give you a window on what we see as the biggest trends, the biggest things that will influence all of our lives, not just here, but around the world. I also then wanted to share with you something about what's happening in our region, in the Asian region. And then lastly, I wanted to come down and really just talk about the implications um, of both of those issues, both the major trends that we're seeing, what's happening in our region, and what does that mean for our innovation system in Australia. Australia faces tougher competition than ever before in all spheres, including the sector that I'm in. We simply cannot compete globally on the sheer volume and size of investment that's being made by other countries. But I think we can compete. And we can compete by building collaborations, connections and trusts, and in our innovation system we can leapfrog that into the new territory. Why, why is this so important? It's really important because the future holds great promise, but it also holds enormous risk. We stand on the cusp of a much more connected world. We stand in front of a world where the virtual will sit alongside reality. In fact, that's happening right here today. As we sit and I talk to you today, we also have a connection with the virtual world for those behind the camera. We stand in front of a world where the centre of gravity is shifting to our region, and that has huge implications for us as a country. It's a world where the diversity of genes the diversity of species and the diversity of ecosystems and their future for the next 10 million years will depend on the activities of a single species, and that species is us. It's a world where, as we all age, we will strive to remain young. It's a world where we must deliver more from less and to more people than ever before. And it's a world where everyone will have great expectations. Our grandchildren and children need us to innovate and make very wise choices. So let me start today with just how we see our future world. One of the advantages of CSIRO is that we work with partners in 97 countries. We work with 1,500 Australian companies, some 350 global companies. We work with national, state and international governments. We work with groups such as the Gates Foundation, and we proudly work alongside our universities nationally and globally. And all of these partners work with us for one thing. They work with us on the future. They work with us on the things that you will read about in your newspapers tomorrow, and some of you in this room will write about for those newspapers. And so when our scientists share the mega trends, and I know that these trends have come not just from their own work, from, but from that vast network of partners, and they say what they're seeing that will shape our future, I take notice. 
And I really want to thank a couple of key people who have been very active in this work, Stefan Halkowitz and Anna Littleboy, who, uh, who with their teams have really led much of the thinking and work that I'm about to talk about. So every year or so, CSIRO releases a, a report that's titled Our Future World, and the 2012 update will be available when I finish this speech on our website. And the report contains six interlinked megatrends. A, a megatrend is particularly important because a megatrend is something that will affect um, economic issues, it will affect society, it will affect environmental activity, and it will change the way that people live and work. So it's not just something that's happening, it's something that's going to fundamentally shift our world. The megatrends were identified via in-house research by our scientists. We have some 6,500 scientists that it was open to, economists, industry analysis, uh, industry analysts, and one of the key resources is we have an interactive um, trend database that, uh, that people work with and, uh, and so that we can work out what the real megatrends are. And that was one of the key features that we do. We also capture input from our partners in academia, in industry, in government and the community. So let me just run through those trends. We and, and others have concluded that the most significant trend that, uh, that will affect us will be more from less for more people. This describes a world where scarce water, energy, mineral and food resources are facing increasing pressure from rapidly growing demand. Population growth and economic growth are the key drivers. And I'm not quite sure how we figured this out, but on exactly the 31st of October last year, the world welcomed its seven billionth citizen. Now, as a species, it took us 50,000 years to reach our first billion in 1800. From where we stand today, it will take us just 13 years, just 13 more years, to reach the next billion of 8 billion. And we believe that the population will level off around 10 billion people. The world economy is also expanding, and these numbers are actually quite hard to get your head around. What's important is where the growth is. It's expanding. In 2011, we've got 78 trillion US dollars of world economic output. It's forecast to go to $111 trillion in the next five years. What's important is that it's growing faster in the developing countries where most of the people live. These economies will see growth between 4.14 per cent, and uh, that really compares to what we're seeing in the advanced economies, which will only be about 0.8 to 2.1 per cent. So we've got population growth and economic growth driving demand, but the real story is what's happening on the supply side. So let's look at food, and food security is an area that I've been working on recently, in particular looking at uh, food price volatility. Food security is without doubt one of the biggest issues that we face. And global food prices are rising, and more importantly, they're unstable. In 2008 and 2011, we saw food price spikes that affected hundreds of millions of people, and it pushed over 100 million people into poverty. And today, the world has one billion hungry people. It's happening again right now. So the heat waves of the US and the droughts in Russia and Kazakhstan have pushed the corn prices up 25%. 17% rise in soybeans, 25% rise in wheat. Now, in a country like Australia, where we all spend roughly 10% of our income on food, and we're a country that exports wheat, that doesn't really impact us much. In fact, many of our farmers who've had wheat sitting in silos